Hi again, this is Jim Seacamp again coming to you this time from my new location in Arden, North Carolina. And I want to talk to you today about the things that unbelievers should know, the things every unbeliever should know about Christianity. Because there's so many things that are preconceived ideas that unbelievers have, that people that are not Christians uh, believe some things about Christianity that are just not true. They're just plain not true. They're not biblical, I should say. Some Christians will even teach these things, but the Bible is our basis for belief in Christianity. And if something's not in the Bible, then it's baloney. So I'm going to go entirely by what the Bible says here, and I'm going to uncover five different things that all unbelievers should know about Christianity. So, let's start with number one. Christianity is not about the Ten Commandments. If we look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it says, By calling this covenant new, the new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. So God has made the old covenant obsolete, abrogate. Paleo is the word. And what is obsolete is obsolete. Paleo, abrogate. And aging will soon disappear. Now, the Old Testament has not disappeared entirely because there are prophecies of the Old Testament that have not been fulfilled. But the regulations of the Old Testament are obsolete. The Old Testament law is obsolete. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations. Once you know, the law and its regulations have been canceled. That was against us and stood opposed to us. Notice that the law was against us and stood opposed to us. That's because it's the ammunition of Satan. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And the law is the ammunition of Satan to cause condemnation uh, to all mankind. That's the source of condemnation is the law. Someone didn't do something, so Satan can therefore accuse them. He's the accuser of the brethren. So having canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Notice that by taking away the law, by canceling the law, God disarmed the powers and authorities. Now, we know that any kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So we know that the, the powers and authorities that were disarmed were the powers and authorities of Satan. Because God's kingdom is not divided against itself. So if God was going to disarm powers and authorities, they wouldn't be his. They would be Satan's. And so he disarmed Satan's powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Why by the cross? Because the law was nailed to the cross with Christ. We just read that. So, verse 16, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So it's ever so clear here that traditions and um, religious festivals, new moon celebrations, Sabbath days, all this is just shadow. They, none of those things matter in the long run. Christianity is not based on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were Old Covenant. The Old Covenant had the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were part of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant law included the Ten Commandments. Let's look at John 13, 34. Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is what God's all about. Jesus, remember, is the exact representation of the Father. And he said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Romans 13, 9. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. Now notice that all those are part of the Ten Commandments. Those are all part of the Ten Commandments. And notice that the commandments here that include those, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Why is that true? 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. What is love like? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. What is God like? Well, here's love. This is agape here that is defined here in 1 Corinthians 13. And according to uh, 1 John 4, we read that God is love. And that word is agape. God is agape. Well, here's agape. Agape is patient and kind. It does not envy. Not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs. That's what God is like. Um, the fact that the curse of the law came into existence because of Satan, who is the God of this world, uh, and God gave the law so that the people could escape the curse of the law, um, that just showed God's love. And then the fact that he canceled the curse of the law, when Christ redeemed us from it, in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That was all because God loves us. It's because he loves us. It's not about law. Law was something that was put in place because the curse of the law had been set in place by Satan. And God wanted to work against that curse of the law and for our benefit. Galatians 3, starting at verse 10, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one. Did you see that? Verse 11, clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. This once again pointing out the fact that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law that was set in place by Satan. Therefore, the law was canceled because the law was put into place so that the Israelites in the Old Covenant could escape the curse of the law because God loved them, because God is love. So here we see that all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. The Ten Commandments are not the New Testament. The New Covenant has nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. The New Covenant, Christianity, Christianity is not based on the Ten Commandments. Point number two is kind of similar to the first one. Um, Point number two is no one is justified before God by what they do right or wrong. Your good deeds and your bad deeds are not what saves you. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is not about gaining favor with God because you did enough good things or you didn't do enough bad things. No, that's not Christianity. Christianity has nothing to do with that, in fact, at all. And in fact, has to do with the fact that nobody does everything right. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Christianity is about, is the fact that God loves us anyways, and he redeemed us anyways, despite the fact that we couldn't live up to perfection. According to Romans 10, verse 9, the way we get saved is if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess or speak and are saved. So isn't that something? You're not saved by the good deeds you do or how many bad deeds you didn't do. That's not how you got saved. That's not how you get saved. The way you get saved, the way you become a Christian, is by confessing with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then... When you do that, it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. In other words, you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and it's with your mouth you confess and are saved. In other words, when you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, when you believe in him, then you are saved. Because what says with your mouth, you confess unto salvation. That's what the King James Version says. And that's the correct interpretation of this, unto salvation. In other words, when you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that's when you're saved. You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised you from the dead, and you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth you confess unto salvation. So we're not saved by how many good deeds you did or how many bad deeds you did. Titus 3, 5 tells us what happens to us when we get saved. He saved us, verse 5, Titus 3, 5. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done. What? What? 
not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, the way you get saved is by being having this rebirth, by being born again. It's not by how your righteous deeds, it says he saved us not because of the righteous things we've done. That's not what saves you. Righteous things you have done do not save you. Romans 3, 21 to 26 says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So here it's very clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no difference between anybody. All have sinned and fallen short. And the only way you're saved is to be justified freely by his grace. By confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believing in your heart, God raised him from the dead. And finally, um, Galatians 2, starting verse 3, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, this is Paul writing, was compelled to be circumcised. In other words, to be compelled to observe the law. Even though he was a Greek, this matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Verse 15, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because observing the law no one will be justified. How many people will be justified by observing the law? No one. By observing the law, no one will be justified. That's the second time we read that. We read that in Romans 2. You cannot be justified by the law. You cannot do it. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In other words, the whole reason Christ died was to get rid of the law, to cancel the law, so we could live by faith in Jesus Christ, to not be burdened anymore, but to live free in Christ. And when you are free in Christ, you have the law of God written on your heart because you're born again. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You don't want to do what's wrong. You want to do what's right. And when you do screw up, you feel bad about it because you didn't want to do what was wrong. That's what Christian a uh, Christian life is like. A Christian life is wanting to do what is right. Of course, you don't always do everything right. Paul said that himself in Romans chapter 7. He said that, told about how he did not do what he wants to do. And the good he wanted to do, he did not do. And that's because he was in a constant struggle. His inner being uh, desired to do what was right, and his flesh was fighting him against it. So the first point was that Christianity is not about the Ten Commandments. The second one was kind of similar to that. The second point was that you are not um, saved by how many good things you did or how many bad things you didn't do. That's not how you're saved. The third point is that God is not angry at the world. God does not want anyone to go to hell. That is not God's will. God is not someone with a stick up in heaven who's trying to bang you over the head every time you do something wrong. That's not God. God desires all to be saved. If we look at 1 Timothy 2, it says in verse 3, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That, that all men there means all of mankind. He wants all of mankind to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what God's desire is. God wants, his desire is that he wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants. That's his desire. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. How many people does God want to go to hell? It says right here, he does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants all to be saved. We read in 1 Timothy 2, God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 
1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient. Remember, God is love. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. He does not boast. He's not proud. He's not rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. And God keeps no record of wrongs. Of course, that falls right in line with 2 Corinthians 5, where it says that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. That's what God is all about. God's not someone who's holding a stick trying to wait till you, for you to do something wrong and bang you over the head. That's not God. God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God doesn't hate the world. God loves the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Isn't that something? God did not send Jesus to condemn the world. God's not trying to condemn the world for their evil deeds. God's trying to justify the world. He wants everyone, God desires all to be saved. He wants everyone to receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's goal was to save the whole world. He desires all to be saved. Verse 18, he that believes in him is not condemned. But he that does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So God is trying to save the whole world and telling them just simply believe in Jesus Christ. Believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess Jesus as Lord and you'll be saved. It's that simple. There's nothing else to it. And it's up to the world to receive that. In other words, it's up to each person to receive the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus said, seek and you shall find. So you have a promise from God that if you're seeking the truth, you'll find it. Seek and you shall find, Jesus said. Knock and the door will be open to you. Now, the fourth thing that every unbeliever should know about Christianity is that God wants us to live a life of freedom. Freedom. That's right. You'll never hear this from a lot of churches, but the truth of the matter is told us in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So actually, God is all about freedom. Galatians 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, in other words, if you start um, saying you have to obey the law, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man that lets himself be circumcised, in other words, that, that binds himself to observing the law, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. If you try to justify yourself by observing the law, you are alienated from Christ. You are, you are alienating yourself from your Savior, from Jesus Christ. But verse 5, but by faith, by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Here we come back to love again. Faith is what saves us, and then love is, is how we express our faith. Faith expressing itself through love. And then back to Galatians 2, let's look at it once more. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Then he goes on to say that we're justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. And once again, you see freedom. You see that um, they, these uh, false brothers infiltrated the ranks of the, the real Christians to spy on the freedom they had. They wanted to take away the freedom. They were jealous of the freedom that they didn't have because they were under the law. They put themselves under the law. 
when we know, we just read, that those who put themselves under the law alienate themselves from Christ. You alienate yourself from Christ when you try to gain righteousness by observing the law. Observing the law will never justify anyone, according to the Bible. Point number five is that salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. It does not come through any other avenue. You cannot gain salvation through anyone but Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus just told us there that you cannot come to the Father through Buddha. You cannot come to the Father through Allah. You can only come to, to the Father through Jesus Christ. John 3.3, 3, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. We already read Titus 3.5 that says we're saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So we know that the born again, the rebirth, that's what saves us. And John 3.3 3 reiterates that fact. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And we're saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Romans 3, 21 to 26. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we see here that salvation comes through Jesus Christ, and Jesus said salvation only comes through Him. So let's go back over our five points. The first thing every unbeliever should know about Christianity is that Christianity is not about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, in fact, have nothing to do with how you get saved. Uh, point number two, God's, um, God does not save people according to how many good deeds they do or how many bad deeds they don't do. According to the Bible, we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. How many good deeds you did, it's not going to save you. How many bad deeds you didn't do, it's not going to save you. Point number three, God is not mad at the world. God is not angry at the world. God desires all to be saved. God so loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And then point four, the Christian life is a life of freedom. It is not a life of bondage. You don't live a life of bondage to rules, regulations, religious patterns. You don't live a life according to religion. Religious um, Religion and religious uh, practices will not save you. The Christian life is a life of freedom. The last point is salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. All the religions of the world are not the same. There's only one way to salvation, and Jesus said so. You notice that all the religions of the world say that Jesus was a prophet? And yet Jesus himself, who they call a prophet, said that no one comes to the Father except by him. Jesus said that. Jesus said no one comes to the Father except through him. So Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. Jesus saved, he already took your sins. God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting men's sins against them. He took the sins of the world. All you have to do is be reconciled to God. By confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. There's no might about it. It's not a question. It's a surety. You will be saved. So thanks for watching this video, and um, I'll be back with another one next week.